Uh, welcome back to Disturbing the Priest. I'm your host, Brennan Baddock, and we are back with another discussion. Very, very exciting. This is our sequel to our 80s demos. We are here with our favorite 80s EPs. Um, I'm joined here by uh, uh, some lovely people in the metal community. I'm just going to go clockwork here, um, and it's going to be the order. Everyone's going to appear. So we got uh, uh, Dan from Exhaust. What's going on, man? Oh, man. Well, good we got, of course, of course, very exciting for you to make your debut here. Yeah. Uh, we got uh, Mem Von Steen of Exumer. Very, okay. very exciting oh, yeah. uh, tour coming up with Hyrax. Uh, <sighs> so if you're uh, in Europe, fucking check that shit out. Of course, also the great Mark DeVito, um, who recently did the art for Exodus's uh, newest release. Um, great, great live album, Mark. It's always great to see you. Fuck yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, of Black Duma Records, Tommy Stewart's Direwolf, and, of course, the great Hollow's Eve. Tommy Stewart, how are we doing? Thanks, doing great. And then we have uh, another member of Exhaust. We got Ethan here. Ethan, how's it going? I'm all right, thank you. Just glad to be here. You guys have an EP as well, Thrash is Back, which uh, is pretty fucking sick. So Thanks, man. Appreciate it. <laughs> good, good Thanks. shit. So we got a lot uh, represented here, I feel. We got <laughs> German Thrash, uh, UK Thrash, American Thrash. So very, very exciting. I'm just going to – so I'll just kick us off here, um, and we're just going to read our list in one go. Um, so I'm going to start with – uh 1984 is uh the walking dead by saint vitus i love this ep i think it's fantastic um i love how like murky and heavy it is um it's also on a uh, sst records which i believe was shared with black flag and that kind of shows in this uh especially like vocally like it, it sounds more like shouty if anything than like traditional doom metal which I think is interesting. And just like how the um, soloing on this, I, I kind of prefer um, instead of like later St. Vitus releases where it's like a little more like noise-based soloing. I kind of like how like you can actually hear the notes in this. Um, but The Walking Dead, one of my favorite like doom metal releases for sure. Um, and then of course, my next one is from uh, 1984. Listen, as much as I love in the sign of evil i think this is a great great release uh experts with sodomy even though the bass is buried completely and the drums sound like they're in a completely other room uh i think the three bone crunching songs on this ep are just fucking amazing how this band could just play so fast is like it's just it's so good it's as as someone who likes slayer to hear just that open e like go as fast as they can play it it's just so satisfying and just, you know, the conqueror, you know, I, I, there's really no more I have to say. And the production for like, you know, German thrash in 87, pretty good, honestly, with, especially with how early this releases. So that um, was, that was produced by Harris. So at that point he, he knew the band quite well and he knew how to get the best performance out of them. So he did our first record. So he, Oh, really? Harris, yeah, he did Possessed by Fire. So at that point, he, he had worked with them for a little bit. So he knew how to trigger them and get the best out of them. So, well, it for sure shows it just like the production sounds so good on the record. Um, going forward, you know, as love as much as I love Hellhammer, uh, Emperor's Return, I think, is fucking awesome. This was the first Celtic Frost like release I ever listened to. Um, the production is absolute dog shit, um, but the material is so good. <laughs> the material is so good on this release. Dethrone Emperor is like this sludgy, cool, like I really love the sound on this EP and like Circle of Tyrant, Suicidal Winds, like so, so good. Um, and I, I know I'm starting to sound like a broken record here, um, but like some of these are just all you can really say is like they're just so fucking excellent and my number four um of course i feel like this is going to be a repeat one for a lot of people but haunting the chapel 
1984. <laughs> this is probably going to be. I, I I wouldn't be surprised if at least ever like if yeah. everyone has this um, chemical warfare captor of sin. Uh, it's like demonic exodus, you know, with an emphasis on kind of that open E style playing. Uh, I love Captor of Sin because it's kind of like a mix of like thrash and like traditional heavy metal. Um, but something that really stands out with this EP for me is Lombardo's drumming. Uh, oh, just yeah. how fucking powerful it is in this and just how he plays and his aggression. Like we definitely, you know, I think Slayer uh, took a, a major loss, you know, after him. But I think Haunting the Chapel is so good. But my number one, which is, uh, um, this is a uh, EP I wish I owned, uh, Merciful Fate self-titled. This is fucking excellent. 1982. Um, a lot of people connect this to black metal, but honestly, I thought, I think this like had a pretty big impact on like a lot of power metal, especially with uh, um, the falsettos and just the singing. Um, I, Nuns have no fun, which is like more of a chord based riffage you know which i think is very interesting and i think sounds amazing corpse without a soul uh doomed by the living dead like this melissa is uh probably a top 10 album of all time for me so this being on there is a uh, you know it has to be but for 1982 like i can't imagine being a kid and bringing this home and playing it for the first time like this would have scared the shit out of me <laughs> the covers fucking awesome like everything about this is great and i know king diamond's a very like hit or miss for a lot of people in terms of like vocally and it's definitely an acquired taste but i think just like in terms of the themes and everything this album is such a perfect vocalist um but yeah that's uh this is my top five i just some of my favorite eps very hard to do this list <laughs> very 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 hard um but all right let's keep this thing going um all right dan your uh <laughs> but, your five eps okay. i haven't got much to say i'm not gonna lie um i think number five i've got a uh, sentence of death by destruction it's a very yeah. good ep the quality ep i think it's very very raw is a very good sound. I think it's just it's very fucking aggressive. I just fucking love it. Um, the next one then, I got The Plague by Nuclear Assault. It's a quality EP. I think the buttfuck song, I, I, my, dad, my, my, dad, my dad told me it was about Vince Neil when he crashed the car. I don't know if that's true. However, if it is, that's funny as fuck. But yeah, I think that's a... It's <laughs> weird. Um... And then I've got, of course, uh, Haunting the Chapel by Slayer. It's very brilliant. I, I think I watched the interview of Slayer. They said that Rain and Blood was like when they found their sound. I reckon this is when, obviously, I don't think Hellowitz had as much fucking oomph as this, but I think this was Chemical Warfare is fucking brutal, I think. Wicked song. Uh, I've got The Eyes of Horror by Possessed. Very good. Brutal fucking EP. Very, very aggressive especially from the two albums before. It's fucking brutal. Um, and then I'm going to finish it off with, I got Surf Nicaragua, Nicaragua by Sacred Right. Just very fast, very aggressive, very thrash. Yeah, I haven't got much to say, I'm not going to lie, but I love <laughs> Great thrash, shit, so. man. Oh, Great yeah. list. E epic list. Celtic was, uh, I almost swapped that with Possessed, <laughs> but that Possessed EP is so fucking good. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. 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 And it's cool. As well, it's just wicked. So good. All right, ma'am. All right. I'm going to give you guys a little history lesson for each of the releases that I have. <laughs> because I feel like now I'm grandpa over here. Um, but, yeah. Get in line. <laughs> yeah. So, right? I'm kicking it off. I'm going to kick it off with the destruction. Um, back in the day, it came. We had it with this cover in Germany. And then... I saw ads with for this cover, and then it was mm. like an epic hunt to get this. I didn't get this until like the '90s, I think. But when I was, you know, when this came out, we all want, we ha we bought this like that, and then we saw this, and you know. Anyway, so 
we I met them shortly after that. I've been friends with them for a long time. Mike is a really good friend of mine, so Shmia. But um, yeah, so um, it was great to see them. They, they were the first band that had a demo. It was in um, a thrash demo. It was a metal hammer. It was in all the magazines. They had the look. They had everything. We were kind of like trying to be that way, um, but they had it all down pat. However, when we first met, it was at um, in Frankfurt with the first Sodom show. They were on the bill. Tankart was on the bill, and um, they walked into the into the venue, and I mean, we heard them before we saw them. And we're like hearing this clack, 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 clack. We're like, what the fuck is going on now? And it turn, we turn around. It's them carrying all their, all their bullet bells and their um, <laughs> spikes and everything in two plastic bags oh, each God. and waltzing <laughs> into the place like that. And we're like, the fuck? <laughs> and at that <laughs> point, we already almost moved forward because at that point, we're kind of all kind of wearing sneakers and torn jeans and stuff like what you saw me wearing at the uh, on the back of possessed by fire so it was cool but you know great great um group of guys and yeah anyway my next pick like everybody else's chapel um with that one i have to say uh i have to disagree um hell awaits my favorite slayer album of all time first of all um but um that EP, the way it sounded when it dropped, because for us, we always we always had to define every every band, right? So um, Venom to uh, uh, Slayer to us was a mix between Metallica and um, Venom. That's how we defined them. Um, so if um, Show No Mercy was more like Metallica sounding, this de- definitely kicked in the Venom um aggression um so this was just uh, also sonically uh, uh an ap that just blew everybody's minds wide open because we didn't really think they could top it with uh show no mercy but that ep just blew the doors wide open for us and the reason why i like hell awaits so much is because it's the most evil sounding slayer record of all time to me um anyway so that's that the next one, um, I can't lie, Sodom uh. and the Sign of Evil. Um, again, funny guys, group of guys. First time I saw them, this is the German and the um, Metal Blade release. Um, yeah, he was fucking out of his goddamn mind when I first met him. <laughs> Tom was in the military at the time. He, he had that weird haircut that you see in the back of the the EP and, and um, I mean he was just a drunk I mean he was just an alcoholic um, and then he was weird because he was a little older he's still uh, he's older I think he's about four years older than me at that time four years if I was 16 17 he was 20 21 just like the Metallica guys so that was kind of old <laughs> and um, he was in the military that whole thing was just so weird um and yeah, first time I met him, he was totally insane, drunk. Everybody well, was at that show. Everybody was uh, at the back of the venue getting autographs from Venom. And he was just standing there, him and the janitor. And he was screaming through the PA and nobody was there. It was hilarious. So, but in the sign of evil, the reason why we thought it was, it was, we used to make fun of this record, to be quite honest. We thought, oh, wow, they can't play and all that. And we made fun of the lyrics because they sounded so weird. Um, I mean, they didn't sound. I mean, like, I masturbate to kill myself. What the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> you know, like... Uh, Isn't that an um, NXS song? What? So, yes. I, yeah, NXS right. song. 100%. That joke. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was insane. The whole thing was insane. But... This cover, though, come on. And I know anybody who's into artwork will say, yeah, especially in 1984. This is an evil looking cover. That whole idea with the eyes and stuff. And yeah, it was fascinating. Um, 
All right. So that was my number three. Number two, I have to go with oh. Hammer. U.S. and German pressings. Um, again, a record that didn't make any fucking sense whatsoever. Production sounded like a doom metal record. Um, it was so heavy on the bass. Playing very rudimentary, but the but the emotions and the feel of that record, along with the artwork. Again, the artwork was mind blowing. It was like, I mean, it had a dick, a monster with a fucking cock. You know? <laughs> like, I mean, what's going on over here? You know, like, it, it, I mean, what? So it was just so crazy. The whole thing was just crazy. And then, you know, the sound of it. And obviously, I did meet them um, a year and a half later after this thing dropped. And, you know, they didn't want anything to do with it. They moved on at that point. They had moved on to Celtic Frost. And um, and it's funny how Tom embraces it now. And, um, you know, I talked to him. I, I've known him for a long time. So, um, and uh, it's, it's great. I, I love that he brought it back, even though after Martin's passing and everything. So... Um, yeah, I, 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 I can't say too many good, yeah, anything else about this record outside of the impact it had sonically and visually and, you know, what was possible in terms of, in terms of extreme. Um, yeah. And this is my number one pick. I bought this record. Um, I remember buying it. I was, I think, 14. Back in those days, I grew up in a town called Wiesbaden, which is about 20, 30 miles away from Frankfurt. And Frankfurt had all the record stores that you really wanted to go to. And my aunt used to live in Frankfurt. So I would stay overnight and then, you know, I would go there after school on a Friday, stay overnight. And then Saturday mornings, I would go on my record hunting run. And I picked that up and um, I saw I saw this thing. And I was, I mean, a 14-year-old, and this is 1982, so there's not a whole lot of records that look like this, you know? So, yeah, and then exactly what Brandon said, I was kind of taken back by King's vocal style. I was like, I mean, I loved Judas Priest at that point. I mean, it was one of my favorite bands, so when Halford hits those high-pitched notes, I mean, I have nothing but love for it. But I didn't expect, it sounded like a B grade or third grade or third rate Halford, but evil as fuck. So as a 14 year old, that le left a huge impression on me. So those are my top five. Honorable mentions, The Cities uh, EP is amazing. Uh, Witch Killer is amazing. And Martial Law by Obsession. Also, those were three important records. And before I rest my case over here, I must say the first Hallow's Eve record, you do not understand how much we love that record. <laughs> you have no idea. That cover, you guys, the way you guys look on the I thought you guys were... And I, I thought you guys were superstars, like in, in the sense that, you know, to me as a kid, I was like, this band and plunging to Megadeth, that song to this day, when I put that shit on, I get goosebumps on the back of my neck. It's one of the masterpieces of our music. So whatever you guys were doing, it was amazing. Just amazing. So I just had to, and I had to put that out there because, I mean, you guys are absolute, you know, mavericks for that shit. Yeah, I'm totally humbled, <laughs> and I appreciate that. That makes my day, makes my week, makes my month. Thank you, brother. <laughs> That's really great to hear. You, you know, you don't know uh, what you did a long time ago. You get a sense of it, but you're just not sure. I mean, did did it matter? that everybody forget about. And every now and then, and here and there, people come up and go, that record meant a lot to me. It it inspired me to start a band or whatever. They say things like that to you. And you go, well, you know, at least I did that. Uh, I did you, anything else, I did that. <laughs> I mean, 
in Germany, and I speak for all of us, like anybody who was in a band or who was going to form a band, I mean, that wreck, I mean, I remember I was working for Metal Hammer and me and my friend Oliver, we, we, I mean, we worshipped that record. Like, we worshipped it. I mean, everything about it was perfect. The artwork was perfect. The way you guys were positioned on the back cover, that picture in itself, the songs, even the length. People were like, some people were like so mad that it didn't, you know, exceed what, 25 minutes or whatever, you know? <laughs> but it was I mean, 29. Were, it, it, it was on the edge of an EP itself. It was right. 25 and a half minutes. Yeah. What's really crazy that we knew is we actually already had four songs for the next album. We held them back so that we could come out with Death and the next yeah. album, Death and Sandy, sooner than later. So like nine months later, here's the second album. And to me, it's like a almost like a set, except yeah. the second album is a little more well, we had three weeks to make it instead of five minutes. <laughs> but but it's almost to me like one set because we were already doing those songs. In fact, in the first show we ever played, we were playing songs from Death and Insanity. We opened with a song from Death and Insanity. Wow. So, but anyway, yeah, I don't know if other... Metal Blade had us... Uh, we had a contract with them that had us um, agreeing to put out an album every nine months. For, <laughs> that was what people act, expect. The fact, for and, people who don't know... Touring. We were nonstop touring to the point where I didn't even bother to keep... And apart, I used to abandon my car in parking lots and would get back and I just hope it's there. <laughs> It matter. We'd leave it in a week anyway. Go off again for another three weeks. So, I used to my stuff was in storage. My cars were abandoned. Two hundred dollar cars. Amazing. And I hope would I could come back. Maybe get twenty trips out of it before they broke. And then I'd abandon them <laughs> on the side of the road. I don't even know what happened to most of them. Anyway, yeah, I was living the the what do you, what would you call it? the vagabond life? David used to say we were vagabonds. David, our guitarist. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have some very similar taste, but I'm a little older, so. Well, uh, well, well minor, a couple of mine are older. This was so hard. And it I'm glad was I, very hard, yeah. Especially like, you know, I can't wait to go back and revisit. I'm like, oh yeah, that one. Oh yeah, that one. And I'm like, yeah, why did I not think of that? <laughs> especially the top row, like Dan and Ethan. How old are you guys? Uh, uh no way. 18. How old? 18. 18. <laughs> All right, I'm 25, so it's like one half of the yeah. It's yeah. the internet age on the top half here. Um, yeah, yeah. so a lot of this was just shit like you know I've discovered online. Where like I I feel like the bottom half, you guys all have really cool stories about yeah. discovering these. Where it's like yeah, <laughs> you know I was drunk on youtube one night and i saw this cool <laughs> album cover uh <laughs> um i did a x purse because i knew uh i knew mem was gonna do in the sign of evil that was that was a lock for sure <laughs> um all right let's keep this thing moving uh mark devito your uh your oh, top five me? eps okay well as a another old person uh i'm a show and tell guy also kind of went purist where whether these are my favorites, they're favorites for a reason, and I'm doing them backwards in chronological from when I actually heard them and thought, oh my God, I gotta get this for one reason or another. So, I mean, Merciful Fate, no fun, uh, Nuns Have No Fun is obviously one of my, alt but I'm gonna push all those, thankfully, none of the ones that anyone <laughs> so far has picked are on my list, but all those are on my honorable mention because they didn't fall into my purest, you know, insanity as far as. So I'm going chronologically backwards from when I actually heard them, bought them because they they reached me. So starting with number one, I'm a show and tell guy. English dogs. Oh, metal, good metal, one. Metamorphosis. This was just a perfect. A perfect bridge for punk to metal. Uh, just aggressive, but progressive almost. I it just it it was it was a much far far farther reaching than most punk I had ever heard, and it was too powerful and and to to not 
group in with my metal records and uh and the, and the title grabbed me but that was the first time i had heard this band and uh was 80 86 and um uh, and from there you know i, I just when legend began and all those and uh, in, into battle and all those uh just fantastic album this was just just such an aggressive powerful ep uh that uh i had to grab it uh number two or number three Four going backwards, uh, sabotage, oh, uh, dungeons are calling. I heard this album and or this EP. I apologize to all the other purists, uh, and it's 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 just it's crushing. Talk about vocalists that are haunting. When I first heard uh, 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 King Diamond on the Melissa, you know it frightened me as much as it made me kind of want to giggle, but it was also just, I mean, it was a perfect melody. I mean, he took it seriously. Uh, and it's, it's, it, it frightened me. It literally, as a kid, I was, I was frightened when I heard that, that and Venom, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go to hell for listening to this. Uh, it was great. Uh, um, number three, this one, people will groan, but I'm a purist and I, unashamedly and it wasn't my favorite it was my it became one of my favorites at the time because of the way i heard it uh queen's first ep kind of similar to that uh king diamond uh i had met i was in berkeley and it's searching for my tribe and the singer for this band pillage sunday who later sang for spastic children drove up in a in a in a, a used cop car pulled over saw my, that i was wearing a battle jacket my motorhead shirt and struck up a conversation and said he'd give me a ride to where i was going up to the record store uh, and i was waiting for the bus so uh and he put this tape on and i i started laughing because i thought it was just it sounded funny just the way he kept this falsetto and going up and down. And uh, he told me who it was. And I was just like, so I went up and I, and I bought the album at, or the EP at that time. Uh, it had just come out. He had the cassette anyway. That became, and it, it's because it inspired a friendship that lasted until his death, which was amazing. He was an amazing guy. Um, number four, because I don't want to dwell. Uh, um, Iron Maiden. Uh, live in Japan, made in Japan. Uh, it's a mini EP. It's a live, but it was it was for me. I considered it an EP, uh, and I just can't say enough about Maiden. It was right after Killers had come out, and still to this day, uh, you know, I, I I I'll debate with any of anybody. Killers has got to be the penultimate metal record uh a uh, uh, maiden record uh Mark. and metal record Mark, yes. are you are you a dio uh, um uh, paul diano guy or a bruce dickinson guy uh paul diano even Wait. though i never Wait. got to see them in that lineup with diano uh but killers was a gateway uh a, a friend of mine you know he knew i liked to draw he knew i liked metal he said he, he he sat me down. He said, "Get this record." I went to the shops, got it. That it didn't never it didn't leave my turntable for six months, and I drew Eddie's everywhere, like all over the walls of my room, all, on my pants, on my jacket, everything. Um, so yes, Paul Diano, number one. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm no, sorry. don't be sorry. I I'm a purist. A, <laughs> so am I. I that's uh, I get into arguments all the time. Oh, yeah. He owns those first two records. I don't care what anybody says. I mean, you nobody can sing those records like he does. Can so no, that's no, and and with uh and the, the 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 lineup at that time too for both of those two albums, the first two albums. I, I mean, they were just it, it it's just a crushing. And there was no comedy involved. No, this is my number one, and this is when I the, the first I had bought this was what my second Motorhead record. Uh, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre EP. And I did this on purpose. I actually got it signed by the band. 
at no, uh, no. three years no. later. But anyway, another uh, EP that never left my turntable for probably a good two, two and a half months, played it backwards and forward. I, I loved that EP. And, uh, and Phil, Phil the, ta the, the reason behind Phil Taylor's neck brace, the story behind that was, you know, I didn't find out until 10 years after, but uh, I just, I, I thought it was amazing. And they, and they pulled it off together as a, a, a and, and only at Le, as Lemmy could do was pull, pull together two great bands and, and come up with an EP that just sounds just amazing. And then, those are my picks. Good shit, man. I'm jealous. I didn't come up with a sabotage one. That's such yeah, a sab fucking I'm good, a good well, EP. Yeah. yeah. Now you know how I feel when nuns have no fun in haunting the chapel made their appearances <laughs> multiple times. I'm like, oh, why didn't I think of that? But, but I, like I said, I'm a purist. I went with what I listened to at the time. So did I appreciate those ones just as, and another band at war is another band on the destruction and Sodom lines that I got into back then. But anyway, I must digress. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, let's keep this thing moving with uh, Tommy Stewart. Your hey. five EPs. Gosh, this was hard. I This was fun because about a week ago, I go on walks in the morning to wake up, and that's when I do all my listening, um, most of my listening. And then, um, so I put on, I started looking up, what are the EP? what, what? And I started looking back, going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I had a good time all week listening to this stuff two or three times each and go, why did I like this so much? And I go back and I go, oh, yeah, 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 that's business. So anyway, if we're doing honorable mentions, I, I start out with it. This was an argument in my head for a while. Okay, this isn't in my top five, but same thing, Queens Reich's EP. I would say honorable mention because it wasn't so much that I was attached to the songs themselves. But the production on it was way better than most of the stuff that I was a fan of at the moment. That was the new wow. stuff. And uh, that's what I was so, that's why I listened to it so much. I would listen intently to the drums. I would pick one instrument, you know, or one sound and just kind of follow it through the album and go, the snare sounds like this. And, there, oh, man, uh, and uh, so I found that fascinating. But anyway, that's not my top five. It's just that, that album was produced so well. I mean, to me, it was at the time. Um, I went back and listened to it the other day, and honestly, I sat there and went, I would not be embarrassed of this at all. I've, I wish my stuff sounded that good. I have to try. Anyway, <laughs> um, so here, here we go. So I went with um, number five, Emperor's Return. Because, um, and it's weird, the songs are kind of put together all, I remember thinking at the time, they're not in order. There's not, some of it doesn't seem to have a pattern. It's just like, let's do this riff and then let's do it again. Now let's do this other riff and then uh, another riff. And I, and by the end of the song, you're like, what happened to the first riff? It never came back. And there was a lot of that going on. It was just like, we'll, I think they came to practice and said, Hey, I've got this riff and just put it on to the end of the, wherever they left off last time. And then they came in and said, I have this new riff. Instead of making new songs, they just added them. And you gotta you gotta know like that. that they were going through lineup changes at the time. Yeah. So that's why it sounds the way it sounds, because Mark came from the States and he was playing drums and they didn't have a steady drummer up to that point. He came kind of right into the session right before the sessions for that. Right. So that's why everything sounds kind of like tossed together a little a little uh a little chop suey there um i really loved it though but uh it was to me it was um like you said hellhammer was almost like insane and i listened to it too but um but then it seemed like there was a little more it sounded a little better the organization a little better i could grasp it better on emperor's return when they did that ep and um uh there's some there's some really good stuff on there. I don't think you get a which song I think it's the second okay. I think the first time you get a lead on it's halfway through the second song. So not um the throne uh second song second. See Crips of I, I can't remember the, the song title. Second song. Does anybody know? Morbid Tales. 
Corbin Tilt. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah, it's about halfway through that. You get a, a lead. And there's a little bit of a law in there, too. And I went, okay, so they're trying to get more going on with that because it hadn't really been a, a part of it. It was almost like punk, like leads don't matter. And then they started becoming part of it. Man, it sure has come a long way since then, but <laughs> it's really be polished now. But I love the stuff he's putting out in the past few years. It's been just amazing. So um, so anyway, Emperor's Return. And of course, the reason I bought it, when I went into the only independent record store we had in the Atlanta area, you had to drive 50 miles to go to this one store, and it was the cover. And um, isn't that the first cover Giger did for them? No, no, Giger didn't. That's not Giger. That's not Giger. No, that's another. That's very um, Frazetta to me. Yeah, no, the, um, the following. Frizzetta. Yeah, the following one. That's the guy what... who did that cover did some stuff for Creator, I think. Oh, I'll have to look yeah. at it. Yeah, it's, it's. I really liked the cover is what got me to buy it. And I already kind of knew who they were, so. I bought it, and it's the only copy in the store. So the next Friday night, as as was the tradition where we lived, everybody, all 20 people who were into metal in the entire 6 million people in Atlanta came to my house. We ordered pizza and had beer, bad beer. Meisterbrow, I remember. Anyway, bad beer. And then we all would put on the, we'd all put on that record. And whoever bought the record, they were the lucky ones because nobody else could get one because it was only one. So I remember I had at war with Satan. Anyway, anyway, that's just number five. So here we go. Here we go. <laughs> number four for me was Merciful Fate, um, which became known as Nuns. You know, so um, I believe the real title is uh, just Merciful Fate, wasn't it? Yeah, it's just self-titled. Yeah, it's it's really good. I listened to it this morning, as a matter of fact, um, again, for about third time this week. And it's just so good. And um uh, there were some runs in there on guitar that they're just like, what? Oh, and right at first, you know what kind of got me right at first when I put it on? I remember thinking, I actually remember thinking back then, when did it come out exactly? It was 82. 82. So 82. I was 23 years old then. I'm older also. Um, I remember thinking right off the back in the first 30 seconds, <laughs> you're going to laugh at this, that sounds like UFO. But it was it was because of the guitar tone, and the the what they did on the first few chords, and I, I I related it to UFO because at the time you're talking about '82, new wave of British metal was in full force, and anything thrashy or extreme metal underground was very underground. So it was unusual to even hear it from anybody, for most people. But I really like that one, and then like you said, the cover. I was looking at the coverage. I remember looking at the cover and going, I don't know whether I like this or I don't like this. I I don't know. I can't say my covers are so great. And we, I didn't have an album yet, but I was like, the stuff that I've drawn and whatever just weren't up to par. And I went, uh, I guess that's what we have to do. But I was used to punk. I had a lot of punk albums. So I was like, well, I guess that's in underground, whatever. This is what goes. Because isn't it just pencil? Yes. It's pencil, right? There's no nothing else to it. Okay. Is it I wonder what kind of paper it's on. But anyway, it's a it's pencil. And I had, I don't think I'd ever seen an actual just pencil cover before. So I kind of didn't know what to think of it. I'm very open minded, so I kind of set that cover aside in my mind and said, Let's see if other people do this. Maybe that's the new thing. I don't know. And uh you know, so there it was, but I really like that one. And then Okay, next. Um, God, I really had to go back and forth on Made in Japan, and but I settled on because of how much it influenced me. Um, <clears throat> Live Plus One on Iron Maiden. Because I, I really love that version of Phantom of the Opera on there. And uh, I love Drifter. I was fascinated with the whole oh, oh, yo, yo, yo thing in the middle. I was like, I... Is that good? that was another one where I kept deciding is that something good? I like that he's having audience participation and I was enjoying it, but I was like, I'm not sure we would have done that in our band. We probably somebody would have said, Oh no, no, that's too silly. But but the audience loved it. And I said, if I was there, I would have loved it. So anyway, the reason 
at the time we were beginning to Hallow's Eve actually started in 79 under another name at the end of 79 and we were shifting members around we decided to call it Hallow's Eve in 83 we had we changed like two members and two other members and became Hallow's Eve I fired myself as vocalist and got our vocalist everybody knows for the first three albums because he was better than me so I, I said I'm going to stop singing and just be the bass player and got this guy. And he sounded so much like Paul Deano. And that's one reason I got him. It's because that album came out in 80. I had to look it up too. I knew it was early. It came out in 80. And if, correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't that the same show as made in Japan? Aren't the cuts from both from the same show, Japan, Japan, or. Are you talking maiden plus one? That's, is it marquee club or is it Japan? No. So got, yeah, those are two different shows, I think. Okay, okay, okay. It's two different shows. I was just getting that straight in my head. Yeah, okay. Because uh, if, if you get both of them, you had, at the time, if you got both of those, you had a pretty good Maiden album. A lot of Maiden yes. albums. Yeah, yeah, together. yeah. It was kind of the same time period, give or take. Yeah. And I was trying to think of, like, where were they, where were they made? Uh, You're talking about the one that they did at the Rainbow, I think. Uh, uh, oh, at the Rainbow House. Theater in London, not one. not in, in. And I have my little. That's plus one. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. This is plus one, and I loved it. And um, I have the not the the redo has an extra yeah. song added to it. I've got the one with the four. I have the original one because I bought it. Wow. Um, women in uniform, you know. But I was okay with that one. It's a little bit more of a rocker than the rest of it. Sanctuary. We, the band, okay, the band I was in at the time, we had it when I heard that. I was like, it sounds exactly like one of the, they said, da 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 We had a riff just like that. And I told the guys, I said, look, we got to change it. They're bigger than us. We got to do something to it because they, they're now everybody's going to say that we're trying to be like them, even though, and, and weirdly, we kind of were later. <laughs> But but I didn't um, get that one because it was twenty dollars more expensive than made oh. Japan, and I was like, oh, "Well, I'm going for qu quantity, not quality." I guess so. I, I think, was like, "I, I that, didn't get that one." Like maybe straight up, almost late nineties. I mean, I knew because exactly the same reason. I mean, I bought all the stuff point. when it came out as a child, but I wasn't like. The stuff in Germany, everything was way out of control at that point. Oh, yeah. Anything Japanese was like 50 Deutschmarks, which yeah. is like, you know, insane to think about for, for a kid, 12 year old. Oh, yeah. kid, no oh, way. Yeah. Same here, same here in the States. It was like, I mean, there, I went to a probably a similar record store that Tommy went to. It was like there, there was one copy. And if you were that guy that was lucky enough and had the money at the time, money, yeah. So it was like, man, yeah, money was money was king back then. Yeah. At that anyway, that, that's an awesome pick. And now I know I gotta find that one because I had no idea. I just figured oh, I got, you know, I got what I got. So yeah, a few years later. Okay, a, a brief I won't I won't take up the world of time here, but it's I have a I have a brief Paul Giano story. Who and by the way, yeah, I like him a little better. I felt like it kind of ended for me there. I liked the next two Maiden albums. And after that, it just seemed like a lot more of the same, just done different ways. So that's where they lost me on that. But, yeah. but uh, sadly, but so anyway, my little deal story. So we're so my band, how is he? We're we're opening for Battlezone, and uh, Paul Diano's Battlezone. It's just me and him and the girl that um, became my first wife. Um, she. Uh, so we're backstage, and I asked her to marry me right there backstage, right before we went on. Dio's standing in a corner, uh, kind of like this, and he's smoking a cigarette. He's not saying anything. There's just us up there. She goes, yay, whoop you I'm going to go get some champagne or something. And she ran down the stairs out of the dressing room. He sat there in very Monty Pipe, and he went, well, don't do it. <laughs> I was like, what? Because I was all earnest and dramatic. Not really. <laughs> no. So that's my advice I get from Dia. <laughs> I just gotta never forgot that. So anyway, on. Um, but I was uh, highly, you know, influenced by, and I loved it at the time. So I'm a bass player. 
So the whole Steve Harris on that album and then Killers was a big deal for me because I was like, this is kind of how I've been playing. It's like a little bit more than everybody wants me to, a little over the top, a little mid rangey And to this day, I'm very mid rangey to the point that it bothers a lot of people. A lot of people don't want to play with me because I'm so out there. They said, can't you play in the pocket? I said, you're with the wrong guy. Let's just stop now. <laughs> I'll cry out and say, can't play with you. I'm not an in-the-pocket guy. So um, next up, same thing. I don't have a copy of it, and I'm sorry I don't. Um, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. I really loved that EP, and I was a girl school fan and a Motorhead fan anyway. And I know it's not exactly... We call it heavy metal. I would say it's part of new wave of British metal. Yes. So therefore it's metal. I don't think either one of those bands call themselves metal. Oh. So not no, that the I girl school was called new wave British heavy metal. They they, yeah. were, they qualify. I didn't ask I did get to meet them. We were our first show was to you open too. I got the the back signed by all of them. Oh nice, nice. It's I got another copy. It ain't signed, but I'll send it to you because you're from Atlanta and that's where I was born. So, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll send it to you. You send me a, how about you send me a, a Hallow's Eve album and I'll, I'll trade it straight trade. I have, I have which one, whatever one you want to send me, whatever you, I'll trade it. I'll trade you. I got a, I got another clean copy because I, like I said, I love that album. So, I'll, I'll send you one in a, in a trade. One sealed, 180 gram copy of Hallow's Eve: Tales of Terror. So done, sold, man. Oh, <laughs> that that that's killer. Because I try to at my shows today, these days, I try to get hold of copies. Everybody says, "Why are you selling them for so expensive, like forty dollars and where?" I said, "I had to buy it. Yeah, I had to find them and buy them. So they're on. So when you come to my show to see my band, my present band or whatever, you can come over and possibly buy Hallow's Eve album or CD and I'll get you. I have a box of monument CDs. Oh, wow. Uh, they're the re, now, they're the redos that came out last year and have four live songs added to them. They're on the CDs only like that from the era. All three of them do. And those come out of my little cassette board collection that I put in my studio and kind of reamped and gave them a little bit of a stereo effect by putting in a certain reverb that you can expand the width of your sound with. And if you kind of conservative with it, it kind of fakes a stereo effect. And then it got sent to Germany, mastered by Metal Blades people, and put out about two years ago. So we did that. So I have those CDs, a few of them. I do have a lot of them. I got like a whole box of money that I hadn't even opened. It's like 20 of them. Anyway, I try to have them on the table. So anyway, I'm sorry. Um, uh, not Big Valentine's. <laughs> uh, Where is? You want to hear a Lemmy, a Lemmy story? I'm standing, sure. I'm standing with Lemmy. I'm standing with Lemmy, and it's at a Motorhead show, and we had pl played with them for, but this one I was there just to see them, and I see him at the pinball machine afterwards, and I'm standing there, and I'm like, it's during Orgasmatron, and I said, uh, I think it was that, yeah, they were, they were playing songs from, but anyway, but I sat there and I said, uh, Lemmy, I mean, you know, I'm younger, and I think I'm on our second or third album, and he said second album, I think, and he goes. I said, Lemmy, I said, am I ever going to make it? Lemmy, Mr. Sir. I said, am I ever really going to make it? Because I'm living in my car and got two albums out and touring and all, but I'm still living in my car. And he, he, he said, how old are you, son? I said, 29, Lemmy. And he said, he said, oh, you might as well keep going. You already fucked your whole life up. <laughs> <laughs> the wit and wisdom of Lemmy. So that's my Lemmy story. No, number one, so predictable. It's uh, got to be haunting with the haunting the chapel, and that that was very easy for me to come up with. The second he told me we we're going to do this, I went, "Well, I know my number one is haunting the chapel," um, because <clears throat> that one definitely had a lot of influence on uh, uh, me, and I loved those three songs more so than I didn't listen to "Show No Mercy" near as much as I listened to "Haunting the Chapel," and I did listen to it a lot, but "Haunting the Chapel" was just those three songs were just a little bit more than Show No Mercy. I listened to Show No Mercy. It was like uh, they had one foot in rock almost. and But uh, it was there. It just hadn't, they just hadn't found themselves quite yet 100%. Behind the chapel, you can see it's this precursor to Hell Awaits. It's definitely the bridge. It 
probably those songs probably could have been on Hell of Waves, I think. Um maybe. They're, I don't know. Are, are pretty perfect. No, I think I think Bridge is haunting the, Yeah, Haunting the Chapel definitely has um like an aura of it, but it's way more aggressive than anything. It's like a compact version of Hello Waits and the best parts of Show No Mercy to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 great. You know, listen to it the other day and all the same feelings were there. And I think the redo of it, um, I think they added a song to it, didn't they, when they put it out again, like later, some kind of third, fourth, fifth edition. When their later edition, they had another, a fourth song added. Anyway, mine's got three. Yeah. Right, Spectre and, uh, and Honey the Chapel and uh, the, the side that I wore out, Chemical Warfare, uh. itself. I played that song so much and I always laughed. You mentioned plunging tomatoes. Oh God, I started almost laughing about it because I, <laughs> I, I used to joke inside the band. I can say it now. I used to say, look, man, <laughs> let's play plunging tomato, which I know is just basically chemical warfare played backwards. <laughs> it seemed like it to me. I was like, that definitely came from that. Um, Stacy called me up on the phone. Now, this is the way our singer would he didn't play guitar and stuff at the time. And he, he called me on the phone. And he goes, Man, I got this idea for the heaviest song you can imagine. And I don't see how it could be any heavier. I said, Well, tell it to me. And here's how we did stuff. He went, he goes, he goes, No, 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 no. I said, Hold on, let me get my bass. <laughs> and I got my bass up and I, I'm just sitting there and I said, Hum it to me. He goes, No, 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 no. You gotta go no 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 and then go back into it. No 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 I'm I'm figuring it out on my bass and then I take it to practice and show David our guitarist and then he turns it into real stuff. So um that's how that was written. And, and it had a, at that time we were listening to Hunting the Chapel a lot, he and I especially. Um so so my little slayer story at the time was we went to uh it came out in eighty four, right? Yes. Um so we went to in the south here, in the southeast, there was not any metal scene or anything. I mean, we we toured because there was nothing to play here, basically, and 500 miles around us. I mean, we had to leave. So, um, but we, so when we went to the couple of shows that happened in Atlanta, they were because I was putting them on. I I would hire uh, Megadeth, and I hired um, some other bands like I hired Nasty Savage. It would have us open. I was the promoter, and those those were the first shows of that kind of metal in Atlanta. It was me renting the venue, hiring the band, getting in touch with them, hiring the band, and us open. So, but we had to leave. So we went to uh, we couldn't get in on this one. I tried. So we went to Columbia, South Carolina. I didn't even know it was a club there. We went to a place called Strider's, which built itself as a pool hall, and I saw Slayer is playing. That's why we went there. Slayer is playing. We couldn't believe it. This was March of 1985. Um, our album's about to come out in July. So we went there. The Five Guys and Hallow's Eve went there by ourselves. And we were the only people there. There was the guy at the bar who was the owner. There was the Five Guys and Hallow's Eve that nobody had heard of, but they were about to. And the Four Guys and Slayer, plus, I believe John Aurelio was dead. I believe John was there his brother because i think that's who was running around kind of doing everything driving the truck whatever they had a truck and there was a car out there <clears throat> i don't know whose stuff was what but we went in and um they immediately started playing they played six songs i didn't know it at the time i've looked it up on fm set list and it's kind of a little funky from what i saw but it says they opened with hella weights no it so i saw hella weights that night and i didn't even know it until like the next November, I saw them at Lamar in Brooklyn, and I knew what Hell Waits was. They opened with it, and I was just sitting there with my mouth open. Going, we had opened that night, and I ran out front to, to experience. I was just standing there going, the whole beginning thing, was, uh, the beginning intro was completely different, you know. So, so anyway, so I went to, um, so we sat there. <clears throat> we played about, I don't know, five or six songs, and then they stopped and came off stage and came out there where the pool tables were. We're all standing around. And I went up to Carrie, and I said, you got to play Chemical Warfare. Chemical Warfare is fair. And, and he just sat there tapping a pencil. He looked at me, really, like, really serious. 
tapped his pencil and then walked off. I went, okay, that's how he is. And it turned out later, I discovered that's kind of how he is. So, um, but anyway, they came back on and went back on. It was almost like they did two sets and they played about six songs again and they opened with Chemical Warfare. So I think he actually might have listened to me. <laughs> maybe, maybe he took it into consideration, but it was awesome because I came back and my mouth just dropped because there it was in, in live and I, I couldn't have been in a better place at a better moment. It was so awesome. We had our own little private Slayer show. That's amazing. Who I wish. Made it? That's kind of what knew what it was, except to us. So there's Halsey watching Slayer. Anyway, finding that chapel <laughs> was uh, really important to us. We listened to it a lot, and I'm surprised I can still play my record of it because I played it so much. Anyway, there's my five right there. Cool. Awesome. And great stories attached to those two. Really, really great stuff, man. Um, oh, man. Glad I'm joined by some fellow record it's collectors as well. Story too. We, we had our own private girl school story. We don't know what was. There was just nobody went to see metal shows. Every time we went to metal show, we were the only ones there. <laughs> so the five guys in Hell is Eve were also the only people at the girl school show in 1984 that we were supposed to open for. And we got took off the bill. I don't know why. I still don't know why, but we took off field. So we went anyway, and we were the only people standing there. We hung out with them when they weren't on stage, and we all had beers, and they were very nice. We liked them. Awesome. Same awesome. thing. Wow. Well, uh... that reminds, I, real quick, sorry. That reminded me of a story where I, we were at Ruthie's Inn one afternoon, and there was, you know, like Sacrilege was playing and uh, Pillage Sunday or somebody. And, and there's, you know, five or six of us standing there. And, and I think it was uh, my friend Flunky turned to me and he goes, he's looking around and he's like, and no one's coming to see these shows. Do you, do you think it's possible we listen to crap? <laughs> and I go, no, man, this is good. I think it'll catch on eventually. And we started, we started laughing, but it was like, you know. This ain't a popularity contest, that's for sure. Nobody uh, was showing up. But I saw, I've seen pictures of the shows at Ruthie's Inn, and even back then I was aware of it. Yeah. But I, I used to, like, dream of going there and seeing those shows at that time. I still look back and go, gosh, I wish I had been out there. See we did the other. same thing at Ruthie's Inn. We, we used to think, you know, you'd see pictures of, like, the Who at the Marquee, and I went in, like, 1986, and said man this is a shithole in another in another city you know and and same with like cbgb's it's it's i mean it it, it wasn't the the club per se it was the right place right time and you just you know whatever it is what it is but i mean that that there, there was never a functioning toilet in that place uh you know they watered the drinks down they serve it to everybody but you know we were in the in the parking lot across the street drinking cheap beer uh, Meister Brow was a little bit above what we could afford. We would get uh, Schaefer. Oh, yeah. I remember Schaefer, too. Schaefer and Schmidt. Oh, it's, God, I'm going to throw up if we keep saying them. Oh, dude, that, <laughs> that was it. And we, you'd have, like, the, 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 the portraits of wildlife lined up on the back of a Chevy Nova. You know, you're sitting up there drinking Schmidt. So, yeah. Well, a couple ducks, couple moose, couple geese, you know, shit like a trout jumping out of the stream. I mean, they they had those pictures on the on the on the cans. So anyway, sorry, yeah. I jumped into somebody else's mix, and I apologize. I've, I've seen some good photos from Ruthie's too, where it was crowded. And I'm, as a matter of fact, I've seen uh some um uh, because Kate Kate and the penis in my uh Facebook feed a lot, and so yeah. I've seen photos of him like diving over the crowd and everything in uh ruthie's it looked pretty crowded there that must have been the good days yeah it's pro well i'm not gonna say it, but yeah i mean there, there was like the stage was like a foot off the ground and right. the ceiling was low so i mean there were times where you you'd, people would come in from out of town they'd hang up their banner and just see the the top half of all their letters you know going you know crunched down and yeah. stage diving from that was like stepping off a curb, you know. I mean, it wasn't that <laughs> that intense. We got we anyway. were so we played at CBGB's, um, and it was the same thing. The, the, the it's a foot off the stage. If there were a lot of there were a lot of people there. Yeah, yeah. In in fact, um, standing directly in front of me, 
when he was in Carnival is Pete Steele. And I'm standing, I'm on the stage playing, and he's a foot from me watching intently, like yeah. from here. And so he's so tall that I'm actually the same height with me being on the stage. I'm looking right, right in his face playing. <laughs> but it was well, very it was a tiny it was a tiny venue too. Right. I mean, you get 125 people in there there you know it, it's it's you couldn't you couldn't move if you did that you couldn't move so you couldn't even get to the bathroom exactly yeah the corner ruthie's in is long gone right yeah right. The, the building's still there but it's like a bookstore now or something it's <laughs> anyway um, yeah i i'm jealous you guys have these memories you know, we for us it's just playing live. It's it's pretty much just paying Live Nation seventy bucks to be like nosebleed on like a band that was playing clubs in like the eighties. It's yes, we're yeah, jealous. Start a venue, find a dive bar, and and take it over. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll get on that after this. Well, hey, uh, let's keep this thing going with uh with Ethan. Your uh your five EPs. Yeah, um, this one was quite hard for me because, like, you know, I usually just listen to albums uh, mostly, so I had to, like, kind of put together this kind of list. It's a bit janky, but I've got some stuff. Um, one I want to talk about, it's like an honourable mention, is Surf Nicaragua. Uh, I think Dan's already mentioned it, uh, but I think yeah, because we're both different, you know, he plays guitar, uh, I play drums, so listening to the drums on that track, especially Surf Nicaragua, was quite, you know, uh, what's it, inspiring to me because his style of drumming was just quite, it just stood out quite a lot to me. So that's uh, an, an honorable mention for me. Um, uh, I Maiden's been mentioned as well, uh, like, you know, live in Japan. I think that's another one of mine um, because. You know, his vocal style was just, it's just something else. Like, I wish I could have been there to watch him, you know, sing and perform on a stage. It would have been amazing. Um, this one wasn't from the 80s. It's been released actually quite recently, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, the Municipal Waste Tango and Thrash. Uh, I have that actually up there. I don't know if you can see it. But I got that going to uh, Black City Mel Records in Bristol. I think Dan was with me. Uh, we found it and I was like, oh, I have to get this. And I listened to it and it was phenomenal. Uh, so I've had uh, people have been giving me mixed reviews about it, though, being like, oh, I don't think it's that good. But personally, I think it's I think it's good. Um, Out of the Dark by Creator is another one of mine. I think that's a pretty good contender in my list because you know, his vocal style as well. I know we keep going on about that, but, you know, his range is quite good, in my opinion. And the drums on the tracks are just awesome. Um, hang on. His son is playing for us on the tour. What? Yeah. No way, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, Venter's son is going to, because our drummer is going, some, he, he, he's actually creator's drum tech, so he's got stuff to do. So. No way. Venter's son said, "Yeah, he'll play. so he's playing on 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 our tour. If you guys, if you guys are in London or in, yeah, we have another show. We have got two UK shows. Just let me know, and I'll put you on the list of that." <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh my god, man, that'd be fucking amazing. That'd be awesome. We're, we're, trying to, we're trying to get tickets now to come and see you guys um, support at this. Yeah. Um, yeah. That'll be fucking amazing. Man. I mean, I don't know how many, uh, like London is going to be tight because um, Exodus is hot headlining. That's not our show. But yeah, the yeah. other show we're doing is just us and Hyrex. So um, that is not a problem at all. London, I don't know. I don't have, you know, they, they yeah. you know we're supporting Exodus. So I have no idea what, what to do. Yeah. But the other show, definitely. No problem. Yeah. yeah. I'm fucking cool. sick. Um, but, you know, uh, another one of the my EP choices, everyone's already said it pretty much, but it has to be Haunted in the Chapel. You know, you have Chemical Warfare. Do I need to say more about that song? Like, just perfection. I have the poster of it, and I have the vinyl on the on my wall up there. Uh, there's the poster. 
right there. Dan has one as well. Yes. Me. <laughs> but um, I don't know. Have I said all of mine? I think I have. Oh, fuck you and then some by Overkill. Oh. That's a good EP. I, in my opinion, I quite like that one. Uh, Rotten to the Core is my favorite track on that one, personally. Um, but I think that's it for me. I think that's all my EP choices. Great shit, man. What great, was the modern shit. one? What was the modern one you said? I'd like to listen to it. Uh, Tango and Thrash by Municipal Waste. It's been oh, 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 okay, okay. Yeah, yeah man. I've heard. The only thing I didn't like about it was it was too short, in my opinion. Like, I was listening <laughs> to it on vinyl, and, like, I was, I think I left the room for, like, only, like, what was it, a few minutes? And I already, I got, like, halfway through it. I left the room for, like, a few minutes, and then it was done. I was like, oh, I have to listen to it again now. <laughs> But it was awesome. I, I really loved it. So I'd recommend it to you. Yeah. I do uh I do have a couple honorable mentions I forgot to uh I forgot to say. I do want to say uh it's kind of stupid. Uh it's kind of like a, a meme EP, it seems. But this uh this band called Risk, they have this EP called Ratman. And it's uh it's a pretty funny like EP. It's a it's a German band. I think it came yes. out in eighty nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's they're just a really funny band, and I feel like uh, I've never really heard anyone like talk about them. But Risk, I think, a uh, pretty fucking uh, pretty but they're good. They're C tier, definitely. C -tier. Yeah. <laughs> but I, <laughs> but I think they do have some good riffs in there, and I do like their guitar tone. Um, also, uh, the Zentrix Ghostbusters. EP, I think, deserves some uh, acknowledgement. I think I actually have it. Unfortunately, I only have the my honorable mention as physical releases, but uh, there's a song on this that's so fucking good. Uh, uh, Nobody's Perfect. Just really, really good shit. And um, the one thing I just want to say that no one, no one brought up. <laughs> the Creeping Death it's EP. It's not an EP. It's this not is, an EP. I always thought this was an EP. It's a, it's a just single. A, Creeping just a single. Death. Creeping Death is the well. It has two tracks on it. It is. Kind it's got of, two extra tracks. Yeah. yeah. So, it well, is, I guess I, as a Metallica. It, yeah. And I, I was gonna say it, but then I looked at it and I go, "Wait a minute, this is not an EP." Though. But you. But, um, I mean, back in the day, they used to drop those all the time. Now the Phantom Lord one, um, jumping. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, jumping the fire rather. Yeah. yeah. Um, but those uh, were singles. Yeah. So all the yeah, extra they had, track. Yeah, they had a bunch of those. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of people. I had a lot of people teed up, but they're unfortunately like Tigers of Pantang, one of my favorite bands of all time. But you know, those are singles. You know, right. there were no EPs by them. So anyway, right. It's awesome. two songs. It's a single technically, right? Three songs. Then it's an EP. If it's well, I mean, I, I three to five self-imposed legality or yeah. whatever is, but it, you know what I mean. If it's if it's if it's a single off a track and off an album, a full length, and then they add extra songs, I kind of took it as a single because you know a seven-inch single is usually just two songs, some unless you're crass or somebody and you got. 17 songs on one seven inch single or whatever they're 20 seconds long but anyway i i that that was my interpretation i, I don't want to but i, but I thought about I, I thought about creeping death i was but i was like no nah, it's a single so i i self-imposed that <laughs> everywhere i see it it is classified as an ep um but wow. i i guess technically is a single you know because it is just creeping death uh, but let's uh, let's wrap this thing up. If anyone has any final thoughts, I think we are men. Yes, I got to go. Um, pleasure talking to you guys, as always, yeah. Brandon. Thank you so much for including me. My honor. Tommy, honor to mention uh, uh, meeting you after decades of worshiping your band. Oh, man, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, Mark, um, again, uh, your artwork is amazing and the um i didn't even realize that you did the last um the, that exodus cover because it sticks out and i was like i i looked at it a bunch of times and i'm like ah this is really cool and just kind of like i didn't really realize so 
Amazing. I, you're too kind. I, I mean, seriously, it's fucking great. My my whole career has been falling ass backwards into just luck and stuff like that. Gary called me up and he said, look, my record label dropped the ball. We, they got no album art. Can you put something together? I got no photos, no content, nothing. Just make it look like a, you know, a World War II thing. So anyway, I just played with Photoshop all day and redrew the Rex guy. No, it's Thank awesome. Thank you for saying. And it's an honor to 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 have sat with all of you guys. I mean, I I'm I'm not only your your perspectives on this music, it, it, it's what you know, Hallow's Eve and Exuma. I mean, it's like that's huge, man. So and, and I've got to listen to your guys' band. What's the name of the band? Uh, exhaust without a H. So it's just E. Exhaust. E yeah. E <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna, you. you guys are available on online? Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, on all, on all you, Spotify. Do you sell vinyl? Not yet, man. No, we're not broke. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> we're, no, no. no, no. But, uh, it's coming, though. You got merch? Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. yeah we, you have a we, website? Um, yeah, it's with, it's, it's with UK Thrashers, yeah, man. Okay, yeah. what's the website? What's the web? So you if you, I, oh, I think if you, if you, oh, the UK, there's a, there's a website called UK Thrashers, we're managed by them, and they okay. basically UK Thrashers, yeah, man, it should, should be on there. Hope, fingers crossed. I, I'll, no, I'll, I'll try to help out with promotion as much as much I can. <laughs> Get a website, baby. Get a website. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Well, this was such a amazing roundtable. Just want to thank everyone for being here and taking the time out. Uh, this was a ton of fun. I'm Brandon Baddock, and this is Disturbing the Priest. Uh -huh.